Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the latest in the uh, IQ Academy Lunch and Learn sessions. Today's session is Landscape and Restoration with Simon Higson from SLR Consulting. Just a bit of an update for you on things that are coming up from IQ. In, in the series on our Lunch and Learn webinars, the next one next month will be Inspiring Futures in Mineral Extractives, and that will be presented by Anthony LG from MP Futures. And then that's followed by Basis of Plant Design by uh, Nick Peatling from NIRAC in July. Just in terms of other activities, just a reminder for you all that uh, there are many branch events coming up in, in the next month that IQ are running across the country. Uh, if you want to get involved in those, please uh, go to the various websites to have a look, but particularly um, we've got the Hillhead Show coming up in June. I know North of England are going to be visiting that and also visiting the HSL Laboratory. Uh, the annual golf day from the Scotland branch uh, and the dinner dance with, from the west of England are all coming up in, in the next few weeks. So if you haven't already got, got involved or got your tickets for those, uh, please make sure you do. Uh, and, uh, and also keep in contact through our website and our events page on the website. We'll be able to keep you up to date with the things we've got going on. Rather than me boring you for too long, I'd like to hand you over to uh, Simon now. Simon's uh, technical director with SLR Consulting. Uh, and he'll be able to sort of take you through some of the latest um, concepts around landscape and restoration, some of the things you need to be aware of as operators uh, and make sure that you understand uh, your responsibilities and also how you can perhaps make some benefits out of thinking about this more uh, coherently. So I'll pass over to Simon now. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you, James. And um, thank you also to the Institute for uh, putting on these webinars and inviting them to come in today. Uh, I found the other webinars really, really interesting, and it's a great innovation, I think, for members to be able to log on and, and listen in this way. Uh, today's session is of interest to you all. Um, so just a, a little bit about myself. I, I joined the Institute of Quarrying about 20 years ago when I graduated uh, as a landscape architect. Uh, started working for Hansen uh, in the central region um, and, uh, you know, met some great people and working on some really interesting projects uh, from, from new uh, greenfield uh, sites and thinking about how to restore them a long time in the future uh, through to implementing um, sites that have been worked out when we're reaching the end the ends of our lives. Uh, so a great, great introduction. I joined SLR in 20, uh, 2004 and I've carried on really specialising in the mining and mineral sector and uh, landscape and restor restoration work. Um, so today, uh, within the broad topic of landscape and restoration, um, I wanted to really just to look at the national planning policy framework, and in particular what that says about providing for restoration aftercare, uh, doing it at the earliest opportunity, and to the highest environmental standards. And I wanted to use those as sort of key themes for the talk and session today. So just briefly about SLR, so we're a multidisciplinary environmental consultancy. We have uh, offices across the globe. Um, when I joined in 2004, we had about 300 staff and we've grown significantly over that period. Uh, what's interesting and relevant for today is that the technical services have grown over that time. And I think this reflects the complexity of restoration projects and mining projects generally, where you know, th there are different interests and, and specialisms that get involved, whether that's hydrology or geotechnical engineering, ecology, planning, uh, land quality, uh, et cetera. And as a landscape architect, sitting alongside and working collaboratively um, with those other inputs. And also sector-wise, so with SLR, we, we tend to span across other sectors as well as mining and, and minerals, which again gives us an interesting perspective with the use of land. So not just looking at reserves but what we do with the land afterwards and working with with other interests other parties that might want to consider a built environment after use or an industrial after use energy power um, and those sorts of things so it's a it's an interesting perspective from that point of view so the national planning policy framework which is relevant to england uh, published in 2012 says under paragraph 144 that planning authorities uh, should provide for restoration aftercare at the earliest opportunity uh, to be carried out to higher than environmental standards through the application of appropriate conditions where necessary. 
So this idea of restoring sites and mitigating impacts, uh, arguably it, it dates back to uh, United Nations, sort of the Rio Declaration in, um, in 1992. So the, the UK um, was a founder member of the UN and that meeting committed member states, governments um, to thinking about the, the needs of present generations without compromising future generations and assessing activities which are likely to have significant effects and really thinking about development and the environment. And that's cascaded down through regulations and commitments, including things like the EU directives on environmental assessments, which specifically says that landscape is a factor um, which may have significant effects with quarries and open cast mining projects of certain sizes. Um, so England central government guidance sort of follows through that and, and a way of dealing with uh, landscape effects is with, with mineral workings is to do restoration to ensure restoration. Um, it's worth noting that the MPPF has uh, they, they just issued a cons consultation draft earlier this year um, that says the same thing effectively in terms of restoration. So for the record, it's, it's pretty much the same phrasing. So other parts of the UK, so Scotland and Wales, uh, Northern Ireland as well, also have requirements to resource store sites. So it's not, not just Eng England, uh, even though we're talking about the MPPF, the expectation uh, is still there in other, in other parts of the, other countries. Uh, and also with Ireland as well, or other parts of Europe, and internationally, you know, the African countries, uh, North America, Canada, Australia, each of those jurisdictions actually have uh, commitments and requirements to restore and think about beneficial after use of mineral workings. So from a technical point of view, what we're talking about today is, is relevant regardless of where, where we're operating. So the Mineral Products Association, the MPA, have got really good resource for us um, on the website it's a map which highlights former quarries uh, which have been returned to nature with public access um, you can i'd encourage everyone to go and have a look at this map afterwards uh, you can this is the overview sort of screenshot but you can zoom in and you can find a site which is near to where you are and in terms of cpd an you know, educational resource it's well worth you know popping over and having a look thinking about what the quarrying site would have been like and what those sites are like now in the present day and how they've reached and arrived at, in that condition. Uh, it's a great resource. There's some interesting snippets as well, which describe what these restored sites are like. So for example, a multi-purpose wetland supporting nature, recreation, environmental education and floodplain management. That's a really neat one. You know, a lot of the schemes we do will have several different functions and aspects to them. Um, it used to be really focused on agriculture uh, as a restoration after use, but it's increasingly and consistently is, is more of a mixture. Uh, disused limestone quarry um, restored as a geological triple SI and local nature reserve. Again, you know, that's an interesting one because the quarrying process similar to roads and railway cuttings has sliced through um, the upper surfaces of the, of the earth. It's revealed exposures and those exposures are interesting. So the restoration scheme is uh, retaining those within the overall sort of concept design. Uh, a triple SI is a site of special scientific interest to national designation. Um, so it's, it's considered particularly important uh, and you can, it can be designated for geology or for ecology, bi biology as well, so plants and animals. So the other example is reference there, a complex of lakes and mosaic or wetland habitats, 200 hectares in the Nen Valley. Um, it's designated as a SBA, triple SI and Ramsar site for its wildlife value, bird life in particular. So another, a, a great example, and actually, so the triple SI is a national designation, an SPA is a European designation, special protection area, and the Ramsar site is an international designation. So what's, what we can learn from that is that, you know, the, the farmland next door to those sites 
aren't designated, but the restored quarries are. So something's happening on those sites, there's some work and intervention, which is resulting in areas which are considered of high value and of interest. And that's an important, you know, positive message to, to get across, really, that not only is the quarrying industry providing essential products, but we are, we are managing land, looking after the land and returning it to alternative after uses. And they could be really uh, significant. Um, the bottom left one I thought was quite good for this discussion today, uh, an area of land adjacent to the quarry, which has been developed into a woodland uh, walk with interpretation panels. So one of the things the MPF is this idea of earliest opportunity. How do we provide some restoration quickly? So using the standoffs around the perimeters of the site, we might have acoustic mounding, we might have services or some drainage attenuation, uh, screening, screen planting, uh, but all of that can be incorporated into the final scheme as well. And that allows you to, to demonstrate some early um, earliest opportunity restoration. Uh, the MPA also has restoration and biodiversity awards. So again, as, as an educational resource, that's really useful. Um, you know, managers can go and look at what other companies are doing. Uh, you can learn from that, see how they've approached it, try and understand what the judges have considered to be particularly good. And that can raise standards across, uh, across the board. Uh, it's also extremely good in terms of showcasing what the industry can do. And that helps to form public opinion and decision makers so they can feel, feel and understand that there are good benefits and opportunities with, with restoration. So I'd encourage uh, you, you know, to have a look at those and see what else is, is happening. The interesting thing about all of that, having said that there's all that good stuff and, and what great things can be achieved through restoration, uh, it's still the case that uh, not all applications will go through um, smoothly and that landscape, an effect on landscape, can be the reason for a refusal. So I looked at Mineral Planning Journal, uh, we did a review 2014, 2015, just to look at this, and there was the, the journal publishes uh, decisions and casework. And so it will say a, an application has been approved for a certain project, or it might say it's been, um, been refused. And landscape came up time and again with those refusals. For example, continuing quarrying at an allocated site was refused because of effects on landscape and ecology. You know, that's interesting. That's an existing site which is allocated and it still came, you know, had, had issues in terms of the decision making. Uh, the council concluded that on another project, this another uh, citation, council concluded the proposal was contrary to the development plan. Um, it needed to conserve and enhance the character and special qualities of the landscape within the national park. So again, you know, some difficulties there. And, and national parks are extremely sensitive in terms of landscape, the highest level of protection in, in, the, in the UK, in England. So it's a question of how, how do we do it? The uh, Michael Goh has just announced a uh, review of the national parks, uh, potentially looking at boundaries and what's acceptable. Uh, the, the industry really needs to track that because there's a lot of mineral reserves and, and good uh, minerals in those areas potentially affected. And there are other examples. The council's landscape architect had objected to a, another proposal, said that the new landscape feature was not compatible with the surrounding landscape. Uh, there are full citations. There's a web link there below to a paper that I did for the IG conference. The, the, the main point was the landscape was being put forward as a reason for refusal. Uh, most recently, in March this year, the Secretary of State has refused planning permission for coal extraction uh, with the restoration to agriculture and ecology. He was overriding the planning inspector's prior conclusions. And for the purposes of today, he, he cited paragraph 109 of the MPPF, impact on the valued landscape, and paragraph 149, where he said his view was that the benefits of extraction and, and employment would not outweigh the adverse impact on the landscape character and other things in the and heritage. So, you know, we or you need to have good schemes in place, good ideas of restoration, um, and we need to convince people of what the benefits are. And I think that. On that theme, I also just wanted to briefly mention Scotland's 
national planning policy framework, which specifically references uh, poor management of restoration obligations in relation to the Scottish coal, former Scottish coal size uh, a couple of years ago now. The Scottish Mines Restoration Trust was established to help communities uh, to restore and bring together viable restoration plans. So, you know, we've gone from the MPA showing lots of good examples of restoration and aftercare and nature reserves, country parks, to, you know, Scotland's national planning policy framework saying there's poor management out there and there's issues if things aren't provided for. Um, and that makes it that makes the environment difficult, to, you know, how do, how do people, you know, people's trust, etc. Okay, so just, just moving on. So how do we provide for restoration and aftercare? Um, the responsibility is with the, uh, the operator. Um, so uh, you will have a permitted restoration scheme. It might be permitted via a condition, um, or there may be a detailed scheme to be submitted. But generally speaking, there will be a CAD or an LSS type plan which will show the restored excavation and uh, ancillary areas and it will show some sort of land cover with features uh, associated so in this example you've got areas of farmland you've got hedgerows woodland planting you've got a track around the edge of a water body uh, areas of reed bed and you can create a schedule or a bill of quantities which lists all of these individual features and quantifies them. You can then plug in rates uh, to have that work carried out. So how much would a contractor charge for planting a hectare of woodland or putting in a stock fence? Um, how much would it cost to do aftercare within those plantations, or that, um, et cetera? And you can build up a, a individual cost for each line item and a total cost as well. Um, we would do it in 3D. So with the restoration scheme would be a 3D model. And the quarry design, which goes underneath it, um, would also be in 3D. And we would be working off estimates of soil and overburden to get a materials balance, or if there's a deficit, an understanding of any requirement to import materials to deliver the approved restoration landform. And the restoration landform in the earthworks is typically the most expensive item within a restoration schedule. So any you know, in, in terms of management, focusing on how you move earth around and deliver the restoration scheme uh, is critical and will deliver the most, uh, most cost effective savings. And that ties in to carrying stuff out of the earliest opportunity as well. So having a, a stripping and, and direct placements, you know, preparing the quarry void in such a way that it can receive the next parcel of soils and overburden means that you can direct place plus you can progressively restore and deliver a site. And again, that's particularly useful because you can, if you're then talking to the planners about another uh, application, you can show the areas of the site that have already been completed. Uh, and we will quite often do photo montages as part of a, a planning application. So uh, we've got an existing site and the top photo, a quarry design in the middle photo where we've done a photo montage and done an image of where the soil mound would go around the perimeter tree planting around the top so that would become a permanent feature and then bottom would be a montage of final restoration so our hydrogeologists would input on water levels uh, once the pumps have been switched off uh, we'd be looking at uh, side slopes uh, and, and, and restoration around the upper faces and that's quite a helpful image uh, again, in, in turn, at the planning application stage to uh, communicate what's proposed at the site over the long term. Uh, I thought this was quite a neat one with, uh, with a, an overburden mound, which can, in the profess, uh, process of being reprofiled, uh, would receive soil and, and seeding. And the idea here is to mimic the mound or the, the natural hill in the background. Um, so there can be treatment works like that. On-site mitigation. So a visible uh, pit face on the right hand side there and then the left hand side the restored face and you, you can see that uh, there's an actual photo rather than a montage so there's been establishment of gorse and grass and that's reduced the overall size of the, of the visible face so again earliest opportunity as and when it can be carried out helps to assimilate it visually 
in the surroundings. And so under en environmental standards and in the environment generally, that so, so MPPF talks about uh, agricultural after use, geodiversity, biodiversity, native woodland, historic environment and recreation. So those are the key themes that are that are brought through. And it also talks about human health and considering things such as noise, traffic, uh, tip and quarry slope stability. So having geotechnical engineers that input and, and explain, you know, the maximum height, uh, what's, uh, what's going to be acceptable as a final restoration slope, settlements of backfill, uh, how that material might be placed, a specification for that, that, that might involve civil engineers. Uh, understanding flood risks, impact on surface and groundwater. So again, you've got hydrology. Um, there might be contamination from the side, uh, suspended solids or other um, materials. And really the point, really just going back to the first slide, is that there's lots of different people that can get involved and have uh, you know, in, input into how these restoration schemes are put together um, so that they are uh, to, you know, to the highest standard. So just briefly, just to run through uh, those headlines sort of after uses, um, agricultural restoration. So typically, you know, on the left hand side, it was the quarry workings, the right hand side it was what that same view looked like after uh, the mineral had been extracted, the floor of the quarry had been regraded to smooth sort of running profiles, and then subsoil and topsoil uh, placed on top. Um, so agriculture needs careful soil handling to avoid compaction. Um, it would need um, grass seeding initially, perhaps, maybe an arable crop later as part of the aftercare, uh, possibly land drainage, uh, fertilizer applications, herbicide. So quite, quite involved, quite, quite an expensive option to do and to manage as well. Um, habitat creation, th there's a lot of um, this alternative. So the soil handling may be less critical. A bit of compaction might be quite useful to give some variety. The plant community ideally wants to be more diverse rather than a uniform cover. So there may be less of a requirement for fertilizer or other inputs uh, as part of aftercare. Um, so there will be different costs associated with this option. Um, our valuation team are looking at natural capital accounting at the moment and trying to place values on natural assets alongside traditional valuation uh, work. And so this is part of part of an idea of you know what gets delivered at the end, uh, and if it's better than what was there in the first place, and if the project as a whole you know what those those values are. Flood attenuation and passive treatment. So you've probably seen quite a few of these around both mineral sites, but also road schemes will have these sort of grassy basins um, alongside. Um, so the idea is that the water level that you can see there, there's a good four or five meters up to the rim uh, that enables storm water to go in and be held back on site. So quite often uh, sites are required to have these, particularly if you've got mounds that are gonna increase runoff um, or some other backfill. Um, then you need extra space to hold the water back so that there isn't an additional flood risk on adjacent areas. And we incorporate in passive treatment as well. So reed beds um, and shells can filter water as it passes through these, these areas. Native woodland is mentioned in the MPPF. So uh, planting around perimeters and at the outset and then retaining as part of the final restoration, it can get good growth to provide screening as well and so the, you know the, the industry does a lot of, of native tree for planting as part of uh, its activities. Uh, recreation and public access I think there's there's more opportunities on this one in terms of understanding the values you know there's lots of talk in the press about the mental and physical health benefits from outdoor exercise and I wonder whether we're really making the case or we could make more of a case when we talk about restoration and the socio uh, benefits of new footpaths and how you know people's moods are improved by walking around um, you know woodland walkways or or um, other areas uh, and also Lou and a brew it keeps coming up as in terms of 
um, what's the best thing that people look for in a green space. So restoration schemes that have got some sort of provision for this included. It might just be retention of the quarry manager's office or some other uh, retention of the services and then the after use coming in. But that seemed to be as key as the quality of the habitat was the, how the people could use it and what the, what the general public felt was a, was a useful thing to have on site. Uh, leisure and recreation. So just the last couple of slides really just to finish off. Um, so this is a visualization we did of a big scheme um, looking at sort of recreational leisure, uh, holiday lodges around a lake or a restored quarry lake. You know, there's increasing interest in this with the staycation and, and people wanting to holiday uh, at home. Um, this was a fly around model animation and it was part of a VR. You could put a VR headset and understand this. And you know there was a lot of value really for the next subsequent landowner uh, interested party on this site to take the, the site forwards. And similarly, this is another VR model that we've done recently, uh, which was for a waste treatment facility. So the quarry uh, that you can see there had planning permission to uh, fill with uh, domestic commercial waste as a landfill. Uh, the EU directors were saying, you know, not to do landfilling anymore, to so look at recycling and alternative technologies. And so the project became looking at a, a new building and incineration and energy from waste, and then it, the subsequent restoration of the quarry as well. So the, the building is on the stocking, the former stocking area, and uh, next to the quarry. And I think that's pretty much got us through half an hour's worth of landscape and restoration. Uh, I hope that's given you some ideas to, to follow on and to engage in this topic. Um, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Simon. I think that was a, a really interesting um, presentation from yourself. One of the things that strikes me that, that you talked about there was the uh, concept of there's a lot of information out there in terms of uh, like the MPA website where there's lots of evidence of good practice mm. and, and again going back to what you were talking about there clearly where refusal are occurring and quite often it's sort of citing this really landscape value so i think it's it's very much the case we've got a lot of the tools there to be able to make a strong case but we're perhaps as an industry not using them would that be a fair point do you think to sort of say is it uh... yeah yes i think i'd certainly getting that information out there and and engaging you know good certainly good practice i know working with the estates the estates um teams and the planning teams you know good liaison committees working with your neighbors having quarry tours and going around previously restored areas on a site as part of a planning mm. planning negotiation and application stage uh, public exhibitions you know get yeah certainly engaging that way has, has got to help i think in terms of the, the public mood yeah yeah Okay, and we've got a question in there. It's, uh, is there any auxiliary auxiliary software which can be used by quarry managers for the benefits of future restoration process? So, uh, um, yeah, well, but you know, any any of the of the drawing software which enables you to do three D modelling. So, you know, we use LSS. The geologists in industry use LSS, yeah. and we can talk to each other. So, you know, quite often and will say here's our quarry design this is how much more we've got mm. um, and we can then we're looking in the same software but you know this, this can as well but so again I, I guess that's sort of relying on having the skilled operator to be able to use it in the right way to uh, um, to get the right sort of images um, yeah yeah I'm, I, yes i mean i can i can certainly have a conversation about that i'm not just trying to work out what we're, yeah well, I mean, one of the things what we can do is if, if there's uh, any further questions from those of you that have attended today, um, if you've got questions, then please fire them through to us. Um, you've got, I mean, you've got Simon's uh, direct email or, or email us here at IQ and we'll pass those on. And what we can do is if there are any, we'll share the, any of the responses back out to those people that uh, have uh, attended today so that you've got the information there. Just once again, thank you to Simon for a, a really interesting presentation. Certainly, I found it very uh, interesting and useful. Hopefully you all did too. And uh, just a quick reminder before we finish that uh, the next webinar will be uh, on the 21st of June and it'll be from Anthony LG from MP Futures around inspiring futures in mineral extractives industry. It's very much looking about uh, how we as a profession, the professionals within the industry can get out there and, and promote the industry to the next generation of people joining the industry and make sure that we really raise the profile of, of 
of the industry and, and what a great place it is to work. So hopefully uh, that'll be uh, something of interest to you uh, and, and something that we can all get involved in. So thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you to Simon once again, and uh, we'll uh, see you again soon. Thanks very much.